All right, this is Emo on Emo's Rock and Roll Magic Show here on 101.5 KOCI. And we got a special little treat for you here today because we have Paul Barrere from the rockin' soulful band Little Feet here with us today. So welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for coming in. Such an honor. How are you? How are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. <laughs> you know, uh, I live right up the ways from you guys up here in uh, uh, Woodland Hill, so it's, you know. Okay, so not too far. <laughs> We're kind of neighbors, you know. Yeah, same time zone. So, Paul has a show on Friday, March 24th at Don the Beachcomber in Huntington Beach with fellow Little Feet member Fred Tackett. So, Paul, can you tell us about this duo of you and Fred and what kind of songs you're going to be playing at your show? Oh, sure. Uh, it, it's actually the 23rd Friday. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. That was my bad. <laughs> But Fred and I have been doing this since 1999 when uh, we first uh, got hired to do a couple of shows for uh, Gibson Guitars. And uh, from that, we uh, we played their 100th anniversary, and then we played uh, at a NOM show opening for John Lee Hooker. And oh, there was so a cool. Japanese promoter in the audience, and he asked if we wanted to come to Japan and do our little duet thing. And so it's just been kind of like a little side project for years and years and years. And then as uh, as Little Feet started touring a whole lot less, Fred and I started picking up, uh, you know, more and more gigs. We do most of them back east because that seems to be where our biggest fan base is. Yeah. So uh, it, it's nice to be playing locally <laughs> for a change. <laughs> Yeah, and since you're from Southern California, would you say there's something special about playing around your homeland? Oh, absolutely. The, you know, I, I'm thinking back to the last time I played in Huntington Beach, and it was at the old Golden Bear back in the 80s with uh, a group called Blues Busters. Oh, but so in, in essence, you know, the, the thing about Fred and I is we've written quite a few tunes together, and we have a, you know, a vast catalog of Little Feet material that we do. And then there's, uh, you know, we, we have some covers we do from uh, oh, anything like uh, The Weight by the band. We were very good friends with uh, Livon Helm, so we like to cover a couple of band songs here and there. Oh, well, that and, sounds so fun. And, um, you know, we just have a, it's, it's a different kind of Little Feet type show because the songs become the stars as opposed to the, uh, the monstrous sound of the rhythm section yeah. of the band. <laughs> Well, that's cool, like keeping it diverse, too. Let's go way back. When did you start playing music, and what was it that made you want to start? Oh, I first started when I was six years old. My parents uh, made me take piano lessons for 11 <laughs> years, for uh, five years, actually, until I was 11. And uh, I had them completely fooled into thinking I was reading the songs, <laughs> reading the music, and uh, in actuality, I was playing everything by ear. And once they learned that, I said, hey, I would love to get an instrument I could take to my room. So when I was 13, I got a guitar, and I started uh, really sort of just uh, playing the blues. I, I, I loved Jimmy Reed. I loved uh, John Lee Hooker and uh, Buddy Waters and things like that. So I was kind of into that folk blues era of the uh, early 60s. Yeah, I just kind of kept graduating, you know, into the electrics, and I had a band up in Laurel Canyon that was called, uh, uh, oh, I guess I can say it on the radio, it was called the Lead Enema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say that. <laughs> yeah, you got to remember this, was, you know, the uh, late 60s, so, you know, we wanted to have a record called Hot, you know what, from the Lead Enema, <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> needless to say... We, you know, we almost had a deal with this uh, this Atlantic record company and uh, a subsidiary of Atlantic. And for some reason, uh, the guy who was leading the band said, no, we don't want to do that, you know. And we were all working at a restaurant, and I had known Lowell since I was, you know, about 15. And he came up, and he said, how would you like to join Little Feet? And I said, where do I go? <laughs> That was in 1972, and the next thing I know, in 1973, we were recording uh, Dixie Chicken, and it's just been a whirlwind ever since. And that's where the journey began. 
It was a pretty good journey, I would say. <laughs> oh, it's been, it's been wonderful. <laughs> well, I love that you keep doing it. I love that you just still added on more gigs because you said Little Feet just wasn't doing as much. So then you started this duo. So, you know, you can tell that you're actually your heart is into it. And I just, I love that. So I love playing the songs. <laughs> the songs are, you know, are structured in such a way that we can improvise every night. I mean, uh, there's hardly a night where, you know, the song sounds the same twice, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a good reason to just keep on seeing you. Yeah, Keep exactly. mixing it up. <laughs> you know, a lot of people say, how can you play Dixie Chicken and Willin and all these songs after all these years? And I go, because I play them different. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. So I've heard a few stories of how Frank Zappa encouraged the band to form when Lowell George was in Mothers of Invention. So can you tell me what the truth is and what the story is with Frank on that one? Well, the, the story that I was told by Lowell was that he was playing with the mothers, and he was writing songs, and he played a song for Frank, and it was the song Willin'. And Frank said, hey, that's a really nice song. Why don't you start your own band? Which is kind of like a nice way of saying you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, Billy Payne had been sending Frank Zappa tapes of him playing the keyboard because he wanted to play with the mothers. So Frank gave Lowell uh, that tape, and Lowell got a hold of Billy, and they got together, and they wrote some songs, and they went into Warner Brothers, just the two of them, and got signed on the spot. Who would have thought how far it would go? Oh, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Frank Zappa, on that one. <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of other ones, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Little Feet is just such a unique band because you guys combine so many genres like blues, country, soul, funk, jazz, all the good stuff. So what would you say of these genres you have contributed when you joined? You know, when I when I was listening to uh, Sailing Shoes, which is really what got me the job, I, you know, I had to basically learn the whole album in two days and then come down and play the band. Uh, I was amazed at the diversity of the sounds and so forth, and mm -hmm. being mainly a blues player or, you know, a rock and roller, uh, there was a certain aspect to it that, uh, that just enthralled me, and, and Lowell said, you know, just widen your, your horizons, you know, and, and uh, just check out all these different styles of music, it, it, you know, it's all music, so the, uh, the greatest part of it all is that we get to... Uh, you know, perform these things uh, in a fashion that uh, enable us to be almost like uh, some of the Miles Davis uh, quintets back in the 50s and so forth, where you're playing the same songs, but it's always different. Love the diversity. <laughs> well, so I also know that in the mid-70s, it's been said that you and Billy Payne were starting to take the reins on songwriting. How was that, and how did that feel to just really get to dive into your musical creativity at that time? Well, it was great. It was, you know, that Lowell's um, suggestion that we, you know, step up, start writing more, and uh, so we did. And uh, it was uh, it was a very interesting time for me because having come from, you know, mainly playing the blues, now I was like really starting to broaden my horizon. Mm -hmm. Write songs like "All the Dream," you know, things that uh, were a little bit more melodic. You know, I mean, I had my funny songs like "Old Folks Boogie" and. Uh, <laughs> down on the farm and so forth, but they're basically based around a blues structure. Yeah. So it was it was nice to kind of almost get into a pop feel. <laughs> but um, back then, if you weren't totally pop, you you know, you really didn't get uh, a whole lot of uh, play on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were always just bubbling under. That's why so many bands loved us. We had the respect for so many and so forth, but uh, I don't think audiences ever really got a chance to do the band. Well, that's what I'm here for, because you guys deserve yeah. that radio airplay, so that's what I'm going to do for you. <laughs> and um, speaking about the bands that admired you, how did it feel that Jimmy Page even said that Little Feet was his favorite American band? I thought that was amazing. It was, uh, you know, I never got a chance to meet Mr. Page, but uh, um, Robert Plant came to a couple of shows when we were in England. And he, he couldn't have been nicer. He was just a sweetheart. And he eventually hired Ricky to play with him uh, in the Honey Trippers and uh, oh, no record an album with them. 
Oh, I, I love the whole just rock and roll community together. Yeah. I love it. You know, and, and it was the same with the Stones. They they invited us to come and open a couple of shows for them over and the, the next thing I know, uh, Keith and Lowell went missing for two days. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not surprised on that one. <laughs> So I've actually seen that amazing episode of that late night music program called the Midnight Special, the one in 1977 yeah. that Little Feet hosted with all the guests like Neil Young and Emmy Lou Harris. Can you tell us about the filming of that episode and what it was like for such a talented lineup to come together for that show? Well, it was it was great. I mean, we had Bonnie, we had uh, Nicolette, we had Emmy Lou, we had uh, Jesse Winchester. Uh, and and weather report we got to you know ask weather report to join us and, uh, and uh, it was you know the strangest thing about it is when I watched that episode they never really said that we were hosting the show yet we were hosting the show <laughs> and it was it was very strange but uh, but to say the least it was probably one of the most eclectic Friday night you know midnight special that they've ever had and uh, just to to watch all those different players you know and in, in the rehearsal. And then the performance, phenomenal. <laughs> well, it turned out amazing. So listeners, if you haven't watched that, then definitely look that up. Midnight Special, 1977 with Little Feet, Neil Young, Emily Lou Harris, and everyone. I know that your live album, Waiting for Columbus, was one of your best sellers. And it's personally one of my favorite Little Feet albums. You can just feel the energy from you guys, from the crowd. It's just amazing. So what, um, what concerts are those songs from? We did four nights at the uh, uh, Rainbow Theater in London, and then we did uh, three nights at the uh, uh, Lisner Auditorium in Washington, D.C. So we had seven shows, and we recorded a, um, a sound check up in Manchester, uh, England. And we had the uh, Tower Power horn section with us, so it was, uh, gosh, it was, it was like a well-oiled machine, to say the least. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, Mick Taylor came and joined us on uh, A Political Blues, and uh, it was it was just you know incredible. And and to this date, that that record seems to uh, resonate more with our fans than anything else. Uh, they've been doing different tributes. Fish did a tribute to uh, to us in one of their Halloween shows where they played Waiting. Uh, I know last year at the Jazz Fest. Warren Haynes did a uh, Waiting for Columbus show. and So it turns out that this year at the Peach Festival, the whole band's going to join up and uh, do our own version of Waiting for Columbus. So, Ooh, that sounds like a fun time. It. Where's the Peach Festival at? It's in uh, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And there's uh, bands like uh, Bill Lesh and, and uh, Bobby Weir are playing. Uh, Warren Haynes, uh, Leftover Salmon. I mean, it's just, it's a really big, big outdoor festival. So. Yeah, I'm going to have to try to get me a road trip to go over there because that sounds incredible. Oh, yes. It's, <laughs> it's uh, I think, three or four days of nonstop music. Oh, so fun. Yeah. All right. After all those years that you were broken up in the early 80s, what was it that made you and the remaining members realize you just needed to get back together during the late 80s? Well, it's interesting. We, we kind of uh, encapsulated it, really, when we wrote uh, Hanging On to the Good Times. Uh, after Lowell's passing and everybody kind of went their own ways, um, you know, we were playing with different folks and, you know, on the road and everything. But uh, the thing that we would resonate with fans and so forth is when we were introduced, we were always introduced as a member of Little Feet. Mm -hmm. So there was a rehearsal studio that was uh, well used and known amongst the musicians up here in North Hollywood called The Alley. And people like Dak and Brown and Bonnie and Emmy Lou and we all used this, this uh, rehearsal facility because there was two rooms to work in. And uh, so they had redesigned one of the rooms and dedicated it to the memory of Old George. And there was a lot of old memorabilia on the wall and what have you. They asked if we could come together, you know, we hadn't seen each other in a while, could we come together and just have a jam session, sort of christen the room, if you will. So we all 
all got together and we started playing and we were laughing and having a great time and, you know, forgetting half the song and, you know, stop, talk. Oh, yeah, I remember now. And then we would play it. And, and it sort of planted the seed for uh, putting the band back together again. Then it was just a question of, okay, who do we get for a second guitarist? Well, Fred Tack had, had played on so many little records with us and recorded some of his songs. And, um, so he was a, a perfect choice for the second guitar. And then uh, it was just finding a lead singer, and Craig Fuller said, I'd like to give it a try. So, you know, next thing I know, we got the, the old lead singer from Pure Prairie League sounding unbelievably, almost hauntingly like Lowell on some of these songs. And then we recorded Let It Roll, and it just started rolling again. Well, that is beautiful, and I'm so happy, and I'm sure all of our listeners are happy as well that you were able to come back together because you're still just rocking it. So it would have been so sad to just end there. And um, I also just think it's so incredible that after a long break, you still return so strong because I feel like most bands, when they reunite, they might come out with some new albums that are okay or just usually they're a little disappointing compared to the older stuff. But you guys still came out and released a gold record, which is just crazy. Well, thank you so much. That's a very kind thing. <laughs> and can you also tell me about the Sean Murphy era and what it was like having a female lead singer? Oh, when when when, um, when Sean joined the band. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was it was very interesting because when Craig decided to leave, we figured we still needed a you know someone who could get the high notes. So uh, Sean Murphy. Had uh, had been playing uh, with Billy and Fred when they toured with uh, Bob Seger. He was one of the original uh, Bob Seger and the Bullet Band background singer. And she's very soulful, to say the least. And uh, so we uh, we were thinking about who we were going to get to you know replace Craig. And she we had her come in to sing some backgrounds on some stuff. And we just thought, why don't we ask her to join the band? And, the, and it worked out really well for quite a while. But then, you know, after a while, it, it was, we were starting to become, uh, you know, I hate to say this, but we were becoming more vanilla than we really needed to be. <laughs> you know, so uh, we kind of parted ways with her, and, and uh, you know, we were off for another six years of wondrous times on the road. I bet. After being a sick piece. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I think it's really cool, though, that you still mix it up for that short period and just, you know, diversity is always good. So that's fun and it's different with like, your long it's, career. It's almost like when the dead added uh, Donna Jean. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I know that Richie Hayward left earlier in 2010 because of his health problems, but he came back for that one night at the Vancouver Island Music Festival just a month before he died. So can you tell me about his performance that night and what it was like since that was his last time performing with you? Well, he came up and he played a couple of songs. Uh, he was he was not in great shape. His liver was really failing him. It was just wonderful to see him again. You know, we had mm -hmm. him in, in quite some time. And uh, and his, his lovely wife, Shauna, was taking great care of him. And so we had a couple of days up there, which was nice because we got to hang out. You know, talk and, and uh, visit and, you know, reminisce and, uh, you know, you, once you get into your uh, 60s, you don't, you don't talk a whole lot about the future, you tend to talk a lot about the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, uh, um, you know, we shared our memories and uh, it was, you know, it was bittersweet. Mm -hmm. I have a great picture of he and I standing together singing Will It. Aw. Got that in, in my studio. Aw. Well, I feel like that was a perfect way to say bye, too. And the fact that he still came out on stage and just powered through it all is just amazing. And it shows, again, just another reason how you guys really had the heart and soul in this music and that it was just your life. And I, we can all see that in your performance. And I'm sure we'll see that on Friday as well. <laughs> oh, you certainly will. Like, the fun thing about doing the, the duet thing in, in a acoustic uh, vein is that uh, I get to tell a lot of stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, where, the, where the songs come from and how they were, you know, a lot of these songs are written on two guitars and just 
sitting down and, and jamming. <laughs> so uh, there, there's quite a few stories behind each song, and most of them are true. <laughs> <laughs> some of them, some of them, not so much. <laughs> well, embellished. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I won't tell anyone except for everybody that's listening. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I hope everybody that's listening will come on out because I guarantee you have a good time. Oh yes, I know, and I will be there for sure. So I'm very much looking forward to this. I know I'm gonna have quite a rocking time. Well, I have one last question for you. Okay. So when you're not on stage together, what is the Fred and Paul relationship like? Oh, it's very good. Uh, we live probably about 15 miles apart. He's up in uh, Topanga, and I'm down in the flatlands of uh, Woodland Hills. And, uh, you know, we'll get together and play a little bit. But uh, for the most part, we're just kind of, uh, you know, doing our things at home. Yeah. <laughs> Care of business. Oh, well, that's great. I love the duo, and I just love the friendship behind it all. And I think, you know, when you have that chemistry, it just makes the stage performance so much better. And which is something that we'll definitely see. We're so, going to have a good time. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're going to have a good time. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was such a blast talking to you. And oh, my pleasure, <laughs> I got to say. <laughs> and we will be seeing you on Friday. So thanks well, again and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> all right, there. You take care. You too.